rectangular coordinates in three space. In front of us here, we have a visual representation of three dimensional space. Notice that we took three lines that are mutually perpendicular to each other. Uh, they're called the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, and they all intersect at a point which we call the origin. We would uh, label that 0, 0, 0 if we were to write it down. Let's plot a point as an example. Uh, let's take the point 2, 3, 4 and see how to plot it using rectangular coordinates. Uh, notice that the point 2, 3, 4 is a vertex of this rectangular prism or box, uh, which is where we get the name rectangular coordinates. Specifically, to plot this point, we start at the origin and we move two units along the x-axis. Then we move three units parallel to the y-axis. And then we move straight up from there four units. This is an example of a point that's in the first octant. To understand the first octant, you could think of yourself as standing in the first octant, and the other octants would be uh, outside of the walls and the floor in the room that you're in. So for example, if you look at the wall behind you, past that wall would be another octant. Uh, if you look at a wall on the side of you past that wall would be another octant and then diagonally across in that direction between those two would be another octant and then below you there would be four more octants one under each of the octants that we just described now note um, there are eight octants altogether, but only the first octant is given a special name uh, the others if we want to talk about them we would have to uh, clarify by saying which of the coordinates are positive and which of the coordinates are negative. Let's look at an example of a point that's in a different octant, uh, the point negative one to negative three. To help us out, I'm going to continue drawing the x-axis using a dashed line. I'm using a dashed line there because it's kind of behind that wall, so it's, it's kind of hidden. And similarly, uh, we're going to continue the z-axis going downward. And again, that's kind of below the floor, so we use the dashed line because it's, again, kind of hidden from view. Uh, we did it for the x and the z because the x-coordinate and z-coordinate are both negative. Okay, so let's look at that point. Once again, you could see it's a vertex of a rectangular prism or box. And we get to that point by going one unit backwards along the x-axis, followed by, again, two units parallel to the y-axis, and then this time straight down three units because the z-coordinate is negative. Notice that the axes uh, split up space into three nice planes. There's the XY plane, the YZ plane, and the XZ plane. You could think of the XY plane as the floor, the YZ plane as the wall behind you, and the XZ plane as a wall next to you. The XY plane has equation Z equals zero. This is because all points in the XY plane have Z coordinate zero. Similarly, all points in the yz plane have x coordinate zero, so it has equation x equals zero, and all of the y coordinates in the xz plane are zero, so it has equation y equals zero. Let's go over how to compute the distance between two points in three dimensional space. Let's say we have the points x1, y1, z1, and x2, y2, z2 then the distance d between those two points is the square root of the square of x2 minus x1 plus the square of y2 minus y1 plus the square of z2 minus z1. Notice that this is very similar to the distance formula when we are in two space or in the plane, we just have an extra z2 minus z1 all squared there. 
As an example, we'll find the distance between these two points, 3, 4, negative 1, and negative 1, 2, 3. Uh, now's a good time to pause the video so that you could try this example yourself and then resume the video after your attempt so that you could compare your solution with mine. In general, you should always pause the video whenever you see a new example and try that example yourself. Okay, so just plugging right into the formula with x1 equal to 3 and y1 equal to 4, z1 negative 1, and x2 equal to negative 1, y2 equal to 2, and z2 equal to 3. Okay, we see that we get the square root of 16 plus 4 plus 16, which is the square root of 36, or 6. Related to the distance formula, we have the standard form of the equation of a sphere with center x0, y0, z0, and radius r. Okay, notice it's x minus x0 all squared plus y minus y0 all squared plus z minus z0 all squared is equal to r squared. This is pretty much identical to the distance formula, except for the fact that we brought the square root over to the right-hand side as a square. In other words, we squared both sides. And we're using different variable names just to stress the fact of what is known and what is unknown. In this case, x, y, and z are being treated as unknown variables, whereas x0, y0, and z0 are the coordinates of a specific point. So we generally know what x0, y0, and z0 are, and we also know what r is, that's the radius of the sphere, or equivalently the distance from the center of the sphere to any point on the sphere. Let's try some examples. Once again, now's a good time to pause the video and try these examples yourself. The first two are very straightforward. Numbers three and four will require you to put the given equations from general form into standard form. Okay, so the first one, we could see right away that x0 is 2, y0 is negative 1, and z0 is 1. So the center is 2, negative 1, 1. Notice that we could think of y plus 1 as y minus negative 1. And also r squared is 9, so that r is 3. Remember that the radius always has to be a positive number. For the second one, we see that x0 is negative 1. And we can think of y squared as the square of y minus 0, so that y0 is 0, and similarly z0 is 0. And remember that r squared is 2, so that r is the positive square root of 2. Once again, r must always be uh, non-negative. Okay, let's look at the third one. So for the third one, this is a little trickier because it's not in standard form, so we can't just look at it and pick out the center and radius. We first have to change it into standard form. And to do that, we use a technique from pre-calculus, if you remember, called completing the square. So we're gonna group all the x's together. So we have the x squared minus 2x and the y's together, y squared minus 6y, and the z's together, z squared minus 8z. And I also brought the one over to the right by subtracting one from each side of the equation to get a negative one on the right-hand side. Now, what's going on with those numbers in green there? We got those numbers by completing the square. Uh, specifically, we completed the square three times, once for x, once for y, and once for z. Looking at x squared minus 2x, we take the coefficient of x, which is negative 2, half of that is negative 1, and when we square negative 1, we get positive 1. So we add positive 1 to each side of the equation. Similarly, for y, half of negative 6 is negative 3. When we square that, we get positive 9, so we add positive 9 to each side of the equation. And finally, for z, half of negative 8 is negative 4. When we square that, we get positive 16, so we add that to each side of the equation. Notice that we put the 1 near the x's, the 9 near the y's, and the 16 near the z's, because each of those numbers turn the given expression, for example, x squared minus 2x plus 1, into a perfect square. Right? In fact, x squared minus 2x plus 1 factors as x minus 1 times x minus 1, 
or equivalently the square of x minus one. Similarly, y squared minus six y plus nine becomes the square of y minus three, and z squared minus eight z plus 16 becomes the square of z minus four. On the right-hand side, we just add up all those numbers, negative one, one, nine, and 16 to get 25. Now that the equation is in standard form, we could see that the center is one, three, four, and the radius is five. Just a quick review of completing the square. If you have an expression of the form x squared plus bx, you complete the square by taking b, the coefficient of x, halving it to get b over two, and then squaring that to get the square of b over two. Notice how we added the square of b over two to x squared plus bx. That's actually completing the square. Now, when we add the square of b over two, to x squared plus bx, that actually changes the expression. So to undo the damage that we just did, we would want to subtract the square of b over two, or equivalently like we did in example number three here, we added the square of b over two to the right-hand side as well as to the left-hand side. Okay, so you have two choices. You could either add and subtract the same quantity to the one side of the equation, or you could add the same thing to each side of the equation. Um, now notice in the third line here that x squared plus bx plus the square of b over two becomes the square of x plus b over two. That always happens. So uh, we always wind up with a perfect square there and that's why this technique works so well. All right, and finally number four here, x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus two x plus one equals zero. Once again, we're gonna have to complete the square but this time only for x. Right, so if we group the x's together, we have x squared minus two x, half of negative two is negative one, and when we square that, we get positive one, add that to each side of the equation, and the y squared and z squared, we don't have to do anything with, the one we brought over to the right by making it a negative one, and finally, we get the square of x minus one plus y squared plus z squared equals zero. Notice that r here is zero, so we actually do not have a sphere. We just get a single point, the point one, zero, zero. The general form is x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus gx plus hy plus iz plus j equals zero. Now, the graph of this equation will not necessarily always be a sphere. Okay, so when you have something in general form like this, the first thing you should do is complete the square to put it in standard form. And basically that's the procedure we just did in the last two examples. And then you get something like this, the square of x minus x zero plus the square of y minus y zero plus the square of z minus z zero equals some value k, some real number k. There are three possibilities. If k is positive, you get a sphere with center x0, y0, z0, and radius square root of k. As we saw in the last example, if k is equal to zero, you just get the single point x0, y0, z0. And finally, if k is negative, you get no graph because the sum of three squares could never be negative. Let's finish this topic with cylindrical surfaces. Okay, cylindrical surfaces. A cylindrical surface is an equation involving three variables where only two of them actually appear, which means that one of them is free to be anything it wants. Let me walk you through the first example and uh, you should definitely try the other two on your own before watching the video. So for the first one, we have z equals y squared. Now that looks just like the equation of a parabola if it was a plane equation, right? So we could sketch it the same way, just picking any x value we want. The easiest one would just to be to let x equals zero so that we're sketching the graph of this in the yz plane. So we just draw a parabola like this in the yz plane, just like we would in pre-calculus. But since x is free, we didn't have to let x be zero. We could have let x be some positive number. So let's draw another one where x is a little bit bigger than zero. 
And then we could get a nice representation of this graph by just drawing a few straight lines like this to close it up. And we see that what we have here is a parabolic cylinder. Note that the cylinder goes infinitely forwards and backwards. And of course the parabola itself goes infinitely upwards in both the left and on the right. Okay, now let's look at the next one, z equals sine x. So once again, we'll start by letting y equal zero and sketching this in the xz plane. We get a picture that looks like this. If it helps, you might want to plot some of the key points. For example, when x is zero, the sine of zero is zero. So we get the point zero, zero. When x is pi over two, the sine of pi over two is one. So when x is pi over two, z is equal to one and so on. Notice I just sketched one period of the sine curve here. Of course, it keeps going infinitely forwards and backwards. Let's draw another one for a different value of y like this, and then we'll draw some lines, segments to close this up and get a nice representation of what this graph looks like. Finally, we have x squared plus y squared equals four. Let's draw some cross-sections. First, when z is equal to zero, we get this circle centered at the origin of radius two in the xy plane. And then let's draw one that's uh, where z is uh, some positive number like that. And um, just to get a full representation here, let's, let's also do one where z is negative like that. I used dotted um, curve here because it's below the floor. So if you were standing in a room, you wouldn't actually see it. And let's go ahead and close this up with some vertical line segments.